Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. Today, I want to talk about magnifying the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things that are being magnified today. But let's talk about what it means to magnify God in the midst of the challenges. The interesting thing is Jesus said something remarkable. He told his followers before he was nailed to a cross and and put in a grave and rose again three days later and ascended to heaven. One of the things he said to his followers, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. He says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Now that word tribulation there is an interesting word because what it means is is it means to be under pressure. Anybody feel like they're under a little pressure today? Maybe you feel like you're under pressure in your marriage. Maybe you feel like you're under pressure in your finances, in your job, in your health. But, But Jesus promised that we would feel those pressures in this life. Now, the interesting thing is, he says, also to take heart because he has overcome the world. So how do we take heart in those pressures, in those circumstances, in those challenges? We're going to learn how to do that today. I wrote this in my journal this week as I was preparing for this message today. I wrote, what we magnify in our life usually intensifies, you know what, in our, in our hearts, in our minds, and in our actions. What we magnify will intensify and eventually dominate our minds, our hearts, and our actions. So why do we magnify the problem instead of our great God, who is the authority over the problem? He is the one that meets us in the problem, and he is the one that will help us through the challenges. I mean, just think with me for just a moment. What have you been magnifying this week? In other words, what has your focus been zoomed in on? Has it been the problem or has it been the solution to the problem? Because what we magnify dominates us. And, and, you know, the, the psalmist David wrote this. He wrote in Psalm 34, verse 3, He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He didn't only say, hey, I'm going to magnify the Lord. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. In other words, he says, as we come together, let let us lift lift his name high. Because you know what? His name is above all names. He is a higher than all names all authorities, all principalities, all the powers in the universe. And the Bible says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against what we physically see. Our battle is against the dark powers and principalities in the universe. But we have the authority of God's presence in our life to fight in these battles. But what we sometimes do is, is we don't enter into his amazing uh, presence. You know, Je- Jesus never said that, that sin has left this world. He, he simply says, in this world, you will have trouble, you will have tribulation, you, you, will, you will have challenges. And it's because of this thing called sin. But what Jesus did do is he came and paid the penalty for humanity's sin on a cross. And what that penalty was, was we were banished from God's presence. We, we couldn't just enter openly into God's presence. Remember in the garden when the first man and the first woman missed the mark of God's glorious standard? God banished them from the garden. God could come to them, but they could no longer just come to God any time or any place they wanted to. Do you understand what Jesus has done? Jesus has opened the door. He has opened the door. He has paid a high price 
on a cross for the sin of humanity. And now you, my friend, have the opportunity to enter into your creator's presence any place, any time, day, night, morning, noon, in any battle, in any trouble. We have to magnify the Lord. He is with us. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. However, you know what? We, we have to fight these battles in life with his amazing power. And one of the great ways we do that is by magnifying his name. David understood what he magnified, dominated in his life. And it's why he says in this psalm, Magnify the Lord with me. That's why he says in this psalm, exalt his name together. God inhabits the praises of his people. We're going to learn today how to magnify the Lord. And uh, in in, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we're going to learn today through, through another king that actually teaches us how to magnify the Lord when we're facing difficult moments difficult circumstances. Now to set up 2 Chronicles chapter 20, what we have to understand is it is actually Jehoshaphat who is a king of Judah magnifying God. And Jehoshaphat was a man who who loved God with his heart. However, Jehoshaphat strayed away and he made alliances with a king in the north and he kind of went his own way and did his own thing and did some things that weren't connected to the Lord. However, Jehoshaphat, you know, it turned his heart back towards God. In other words, he he repented of not following God. He had strayed away, and now he makes a 180. He makes a turn, and he says, now I want to follow God with my life. You know, the Bible says that we have all strayed away from the good things of the Lord. But the way to enter back into God's presence is to repent of going our own way, our own direction, and turning our hearts back towards the goodness of God and what he's done in our life through the Christ Jesus. In other words, we repent of our sin. We turn away from it and we turn towards the goodness of God in Jesus is right there waiting for us and will open the door for us to enter into God's amazing presence. But the interesting thing is, is the moment you enter into God's presence is the moment the battle seems to intensify against your faith. Let me say that again. The moment you enter into God's amazing presence through Christ Jesus is the moment the battle seems to intensify against your faith. And and when we look at God's word, we can begin to understand what we have to do is we we have to learn to guard our faith in such a way that the seed of, of God's word gets in our heart, takes root, grows up and produces something great out of our life. It's, it's why Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 13. It's called the parable of the sower. And Jesus basically shares about a a man going out and planting seed. And the seed represented the word of God. And the seed was always the same seed and it was good seed. Anybody remember that story Jesus told in Matthew 13? He says, you know what? The seed is the same. It's always good. How many of you know God's word is always good? God's presence is always good. And he says, And the man planted the seed on some different kinds of soils, which represents the faith of people's heart. And he plants the the seed on one one, uh, heart or on one soil and, and the enemy comes and before the seed can take root, snatches it away. Can I tell you, the moment you repent of your sin and you turn your heart towards God and you enter into God's presence, you know what, the enemy realizes that, you know what, he can't take you out, but what he can do is snatch away the seed of God's good word and keep you from from progressing and moving forward with the great faith that God wants to encourage in you and the very grace that God has given you. 
Then it goes on to say, in that same parable, that there's worries and cares and thorns and thistles that choke out some of the other seed. And, and can I tell you, there's a lot of that going on in the world today. Choking out the, the good word of God in people's life. So what we have to learn to do is magnify the Lord. When we magnify the Lord, it's like the good soul. In other words, it, it's a, a heart that the good word of God can root down in. And as it roots down, it can burst forth and it can produce great things. Do you know that that's what God wants to do in your heart, in your life? He's not gonna take you out of this world right now, you know what, that is filled with sin. He'll do that in his own timing. But what he wants to do is he wants to water that word in your heart in such a powerful way that you magnify and glorify him against all the powers and principalities in the dark realm while you are in this world. He will bring up there, down here. His kingdom will come to earth as it is in heaven. And how he does it is when we magnify him through the process in everything we do. So what are you magnifying right now? Are you magnifying the problem? Or are you magnifying the Lord. See, our emotions typically move in the direction of being fearful or afraid whenever a problem arises. And I want you to know that's okay. As long as you can take hold of those emotions and not let those emotions carry you down such a path that it's a dead end street. And we learn from Jehoshaphat today, this king who repented, who turned his heart back towards God. We learn how to magnify the Lord. Look what it says here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. After this, after he repented, immediately the armies of Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Muonites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Three different units gathered together and declared war on uh, Jehoshaphat and God's people. Listen to what it says. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat. Messengers, messengers, messengers. Anybody know some messengers of bad news today? Yeah. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. And guess what? They are already at Hazan Tamamar. That means they're real close. Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, was immediately terrified. See the emotion. Because the enemy had moved in. They had gotten close. And now a messenger comes and says, Hope, trouble is here. And it's right upon us. And guess what? It's going to take us out. And it's going to all be over. And, and, and you know what? Your, your life is, is not going to move forward. But the Bible says something interesting here in verse 3. That was his immediate emotion. And a lot of times it's my immediate emotion too, right? Fear rises up. I began to retreat when trouble comes. Remember, Jesus didn't ever say that you weren't going to experience tribulation. Amen. You weren't going to experience pressure. You weren't going to experience three armies coming at you at one time. No, no. Jesus said, in this world, they're coming at you. But take heart. Because I have overcome the world. The Bible says, basically, Jehoshaphat grabs hold of his emotions of fear. And this is what he says. He says in, in, in verse 3, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3, he begged the Lord for guidance. When's the last time you magnify God? By begging him for guidance. God, I need guidance in this situation. God, I know that Jesus has opened the door for me to enter into your most holy presence. And what I want to do is I want to enter into my creator's presence. Amen. And I want to get some good guidance from you on these challenges because the world seems to be closing in on me. The trouble is real. 
The tribulation is real. The pressures are here. They feel like a heavy rock. And I don't know if I can take another step forward and do anything in my life. But, but he takes hold of his emotion, goes to God for guidance. And look how he magnifies God. The Bible says he also ordered everyone else in, in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and, and Jerusalem and in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed. O oh Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty and no one can stand against you. I want you to notice something about Jehoshaphat's prayer. He didn't go to God praying and magnifying his problem. The messengers came and said, Jehoshaphat, there's, there's three different enemies about to take us out. Immediately he was fearful, he goes to the Lord for guidance, and how he begins to magnify God is, is he begins to talk about God's great power. I want you to understand, if you want to magnify the Lord, you have to understand God's great power. He didn't talk about his problem to God. He talked about God's great power and how he had the authority over the problem, how he was over every kingdom, how he was powerful, how he was mighty, and how nothing could stand up against him. I wonder when the last time that you magnified, you brought light to God's amazing power. Because if we're going to move forward in the problems, we can't magnify the problems. The media is doing that enough. We need to magnify the power of God. Now, when I was growing up, my mom used to tell me and my cousin who I often did childhood things with, his name was Robert. When we would come into her presence, she would say, don't play with matches. And for a good reason. She didn't want that, that flash to start a fire that, that we couldn't control, right? And, and so I discovered there was another way to start a fire. And I discovered that if I took a magnifying glass and I, was, I consistently held it still and I, I let the light shine through the glass on a, on a pile of leaves and I, and I was patient. Come on, somebody. And, and I was consistent and I was focused that that Eventually, that light could shine through that magnifying glass and it could heat up a, a leaf and it would begin to start smoldering and eventually it would burst into flames and there would be something amazing. And, and what I learned from that, that I want to share with you today, that's how you magnify the power of God. You don't play with matches. You don't play with all the flashes. You don't just scroll through Instagram and Facebook and let that get in your mind and in your heart and in your, uh, in your actions. You don't see just basically what everything else is, is happening in the world. All these little news flashes, you know what I'm saying? That, that's dominating your thoughts, shaping your mind, shaping your heart, shaping your actions. No, no, no. You go to the all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at one time God and you consistently stand and hold your life in such a way that that light can shine on you and shine through you and begin to burst something into the atmosphere that is amazing. My friend, that's how you magnify the Lord. You stand on what Christ Jesus has already done. And you stand and you enter into God's 
most holy and set apart presence. And you don't back down from that. As you're looking at all these things that are wanting to feed your soul and feed your mind. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have tribulation. And guess what? According to Josephat's story, sometimes three or four of them are going to come at you at one time. So what do you do? You magnify the Lord's power. You begin to remember who he is. You know, you say, well, how do you practically do that? Well, how I do it is I reflect back on what God's already done. Do you know his power? Do you know he is the one that parted and held back the Red Sea? So a group of Egyptians could not chase the Israelite people any further and put any more pressure on them. God opened it so his people could enter into his amazing presence. He held back the Red Sea. That, that same power is here today. Did you know uh, that I began to think about God's amazing power as one little shepherd boy stood before a giant that was defying the armies of the living God, speaking out against the power of the living God. And he stands in the presence of everybody and he says, who is this Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? You know what? Not my power, not my might, but it's God with me and I'm gonna step out against the giant and I'm gonna take the giant out. That's the power of God. Do you ever reflect on that amazing power? Do you ever reflect on the power of God that entered into those disciples and they preach boldly about the resurrection of Jesus Christ at Pentecost? When's the last time you begin to think about the power of God? How about the same God that they killed a man, our Savior, Jesus? They took his life Cruelly, you know what? They ripped his skin apart. They they bound him up. They put him in a in a tomb. How about that God who rolled away that tomb and walked out of death itself to pay for the sin that's keeping you from the presence of God? When's the last time you really reflected on the power of God? If he had the power to walk out of a grave, don't you think he that same power? can push back the powers and principalities in the universe that want to hold you back from your God potential. You want to magnify God. Call out God's power. Remember his amazing power. The second thing I wrote down is this. Remember his promise. Amen. And confess his promise. And more so than that, hold God accountable Amen. to his promise. Yes, Lord. God doesn't need accountability. But you know what? He loves it when you call on him and say, I need you to give an account for your promise. See, God has made promises and he doesn't back down from them. We may fade. The Bible says we will be unfaithful, but he will always be faithful. You want to magnify God in the midst of a problem, in the midst of the challenges? Then begin to confess his promises. Begin to, to talk about his promises in your heart. Remember his promise. Talk about his promises to him. Look, look what the Bible says here in this passage in, in, in 2 Chronicles. It's what Jehoshaphat does. It says it this way. It says, Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people, uh, Israel, arrived? He asked God a question. And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? God, God, wasn't that you? Didn't you make a promise to your friend Abraham? Didn't you say something to Abraham that his descendants would have this land? He says, your people settled here. They built this temple to honor your name. Amen. So basically saying, God, these enemies are coming against us, your people. We have, are trusting on your amazing power. But God, I need you to remember what your promise is. 
I'm in a special relationship with you, God, is what Jehoshaphat is saying. And you made a promise. You made a covenant. And it wasn't just an agreement. It wasn't a document. It was signed, sealed, and delivered with your amazing blood. In other words, God, you know what? You signed your signature on a cross at Calvary. You gave your blood to say that I am forgiven of my sin. You didn't give your love and promise that this world would never have trouble in it. That's the problem. Most people make God promise something he has never promised. If we get the promise straight about who God is and what he's done for humanity and what we're experiencing in this journey called life and this trouble, and we begin to call on the God of the universe to fulfill his promise, I'm here to declare to you today, God has never not fulfilled one of his promises and he is gonna do what he says he's gonna do, but you've gotta magnify his promises. Again, a lot of times we're making out God to be a liar because we're saying that God's gonna do something that he never promised to do. And I need you to understand, in this world, you will have pressure. But take heart. Because Jesus overcome the world, and you will too. Trust in his amazing promise. Don't you let it keep you in the valley. You want to win the battle? Trust what Christ has already done. Your presence is an open door. And the only reason it's an open door is because a Savior came and gave his life. And God, because he came to give his life for me and the people around, I lift your name and I trust it by faith all the days of my life. And so when I look at people, I know the promise that God has given to me is available to them. Amen. Because the promise isn't based on who we are. It's based on who he is. Yes. And all I got to try to do is, is help convince people by my faith walk and faith journey that he is who he says he is so that they'll take their faith and put it in this great God too. Amen. I don't care if it's a little bit of faith because God is who he says he is yeah. and he's gonna yeah. do what he says he's gonna do and I believe it in all of my heart and what we've gotta do is take heart all the days of our life and keep marching forward as a church and be his people. There's something magnificent about coming together and using your gift. Something awesome that happens. Amen. You want to know how God is going to defeat the powers and principalities in the dark places? It's going to be done through the power of his grace and his spirit that rests in us and us participating by faith with everything he has given us. Amen. And, and God is taking his people. We're his army. We're his covenant people. Yes, we are the people that Jesus gave his blood for on the cross. And my friend, you know what? We can claim the promise over and over and over again. And, you know, oftentimes when, when I get a, a mind of doubt and the pressure's heavy, I, I just start confessing the promises of God out of my mouth and what, he, what, he's, what he's not just promised another group of people or a person or somebody else in the Bible. He promised that. But I know that, that he has promised eternal life for me and he's, He's made a covenant promise with me and I'm going to hold on that all the days of my life. It's how you magnify the Lord. It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any better in the battle than to magnify God. And the last thing I wrote down is this, is if we're going to magnify the Lord, we do it with our praise. Amen. We do it with our praise. Now, this is interesting. Because, again, Jehoshaphat was facing a very difficult circumstance and all the people were too. And he goes to the Lord for guidance. He begins to call out to God his amazing power. He begins to confess the promises. And then the Bible says this. 
It says, early the next morning, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and he said to the people, now he's the leader, he's the king. There's a mass number of people. He says, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. Believe in the Lord your God. Don't just focus on the problem. Magnify and believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king approached singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. That is weird. Three armed armies are at the gate, ready to take Jehoshaphat and his people out. Three of the ites, I want you to know the ites in the Old Testament, all of these ites in this physical battle that went on with the people of Israel against the ites represent and manifest themselves in our life. They're, they're different spiritual battles that you and I are, 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 that are being fought over our life in the spiritual realm. And the Bible says the battle belongs to the Lord, but we have to stand in the battle and we have to put on God's amazing grace, His amazing love, His righteousness, all that Jesus has offered. We have to stand, we have to stand, we have to stand. But, but this, this commander, this king, he says, send the choir out in front of the warriors. That's weird. But see, the king understood that God inhabits the praises of his people. And the king understood that when we sing him, our creator, great praises, it unleashes his power and his promises against those powers and principalities that stand in the way of us advancing forward with his great kingdom. Look what it says. They sang. They sang this. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. And at that very moment, they began to sing and give praise. The Lord caused the armies to go into confusions to Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. So they, they began to fight among themselves and, and take each other out. Did you know that the enemy will end up fighting among himself and taking himself out? But how it begins to happen is this. God's people rise up and begin to praise him in spite of all the spiritual enemies that we face on a daily basis. And we began to magnify his name. We began to praise his name. We began to lift his name. And again, it's not just with our lips, it's with our heart. Man, when we sing these songs, it's not just lyrics, it's not just music. No, no, no. If you begin to get it in your heart and it begins to be produced out of your mouth and you begin to give this great God some amazing, amazing praise for who he is and his incredible power and his amazing promises and you begin to praise him and you don't just sit there and you begin to lift your voice and praise him praise him through these lyrics you begin to do this in such a way it opens up an atmosphere in the spiritual realms a lot of people want to know <laughs> why do I bring Jill out here to start playing that music at the end of my message it shifts the atmosphere it's not just an emotional thing it's 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 music and heart and it's, it's, it's shifting the atmosphere in the room where you're sitting in such a way that you become more receptive to the spiritual things that God wants to deposit in your heart. And, and so the reason I call on a harpist 
or a piano person or whoever's playing this music behind me, oftentimes is because, you know what, we're, we're in a battle. Every time we come here to encourage your faith, we're in a battle. And what we're doing is, is you know, we've been fighting, 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 fighting. And now, you know, we want to shift the atmosphere so that your heart can respond to what God wants to do. But what I want to get you to respond to today is the name of Jesus. And how we're going to do that, we're not, we're not getting ready to leave yet, by the way. We're getting ready to stand and praise Jesus again with the same song that we sung as we were opening up just a few minutes ago. So I'm going to ask that the worship team come and gets in place while I'm talking right here. But I want to remind you of what that song says. It says, God, your presence is an open In other words, there's nothing that can keep me. There's no demon in hell. There's no person. There's no problem. There's nothing I have done or nothing I will do that can keep me from entering your presence. But I have to have faith that you open the door through Christ Jesus. So will you sing God praise today when you sing this song? Your presence is an open door. Will you sing God praise because of his gift to humanity named Jesus? Yeah, I know a breakthrough's coming. And a miracle can happen. But I have to enter my Creator's amazing presence through Christ Jesus yet. Yeah. And maybe as we begin to sing this song of praise to our great God and declare this today, here at the end, maybe what God's going to do is, is God's going to give your faith a target to begin to land on. And His name is Jesus. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful giving that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.